Um, so yeah, as mentioned, uh, this is around uh, the user namespace and some of its shortcomings, especially as far as, as consuming it and using it. And some of the, the things we've noticed over the years and some ideas we have on how we could maybe make it um, more developer slash user friendly to an extent. And uh, also, you know, integrating, look, looking back at some of the stuff that's been landing in, in Linux over the past year or so and how that might all fit together. So um, kind of going through the state of things first. Uh, and as a reminder, UID and GID space in kernel is global. It's UN32 for both of them. Uh, that's also how, I mean, that's effectively what POSIX specifies uh, or, or how user space treats it in general. So not something we can just willy-nilly change. Um, user namespaces can be created by unprivileged users. Um, they effectively allow mapping. Well, for an unprivileged user, they are mapping their own UID and GID to anything that they want within that namespace. The unmapped, anything that's unmapped, so anything that's not available in one user namespace is effectively unusable. Um, and anything that comes from the outside of that namespace from a UID that is not mapped appears as the overflow UID and GID. It's effectively you know, what you're expecting as far as uh, current user namespace behavior. There are a number of privileged helpers to try and, and make things a bit nicer. So mostly thinking of new UID map, new GID map that come from the shadow project. Those tools allow delegating a range of UID and GID to users. So you use ITC sub UID, ITC sub GID, which then lets you allocate ranges. And I believe at least on Ubuntu and I think most at the top of the list shows, the default tends to be 65, 136 UIDs and GIDs allocated per interactive user on the system. The idea being that they can effectively run a POSIX compliant-ish environment using that, that range. Um, it works. Uh, it does require a UID wrapper, which some people are super keen on. Uh, I'm sure we can maybe newer Shadow uses FS caps instead, uh, but effectively yeah, you need such UID right now. Um, it's, it, it's some, one of the issues, like if you want a larger range, you're going to have to be kind of careful. Uh, you can change the settings, you can do some things there, but you don't want to really have, have overlaps between multiple users. And the same thing, you probably don't want to actually have any shared UIDs or GIDs. The issue being that if two users get to access them, they, they might not be only, they might not only be using them for a fully separate container, they might be able to just create a user namespace, use the UID in there, and then access resources on the host system that is owned by that UID. So say, kind of the worst case scenario that we see happening over and over again is a system configured to do network authentication. Uh, those will often use, say, a 200,000 to 500,000 range for network mapped UIDs. But then if this system is not configured specifically to avoid that, then some of those users will actually get a delegated UID and GID range, which includes those network users. And so they would be able to create a user namespace and get someone else's UID and GID effectively mapped into it, and then can access uh, potentially processes or data that's owned by those users. So there's some difficulty there. It's nothing that can't be sorted with a lot of careful configuration, but keeping in mind all of the different cases of network file system, network authentication systems, variety of user space tools that do a variety of different things uh, with, with the UID allocation, like especially using way past the use, usual kind of POSIX range. Like we've, we've got tools now that do dynamic UID and GID allocation for specific subprocesses as like a security mechanism and use UIDs and GIDs all over the place, making it really hard to get a safe chunk that we can then give for containers to use as both process ownership and file system access. So it, it, yeah, there, there are some difficulties there. Um, I think another case where we've had some difficulties just when you run multiple uh, container managers on one system and having to kind of deal with, you know, mediating things so that they don't use, ideally so they do use different ranges, uh, or if they use the same range that they use them at least in the same way and there's no weird we had issues uh, with those. So that's effectively the state of things um, with how user namespaces work, how the current configuration works when you want to do something more than mapping your own UID and GID. Um, 
and how that can get problematic with some of the other tools we've seen out there. Um, did I miss anything on that, Christian? No, I don't think so. Okay, cool. Um, so as far as rough improvements, we'd, we'd love to see and that we think would, would make for the experience to be quite a bit nicer. Um, Ideally, you would want user namespaces to effectively be able to use an entire UN32 uh, UID and GID range. That would be, you know, perfect world. That'd be amazing. You can run any software. You don't have to care. Everything just works. Um, obviously, it's a good reason why it doesn't work that way right now. Like if it was easy to do it that way, that's how user namespaces would have been done in the first place. Uh, we perfectly realized that. Um, we would also like to make it possible for fully unprivileged user to get a user namespace that has more than a single UID and GID. Again, there's a very good reason why it's done the way it is right now. Um, but as a nice thing, as far as consuming is an species and dealing with them, that'd be great to have. Um, we'd like also to be able to run multiple container managers on the system and not need any kind of collaboration because we've seen that that gets tricky, like behaviors change between versions and like, I mean, in general, you don't really like having to deal with your potential competitor in general. Uh, so having to do kind of mediation around, around that has been problematic and often just not done and causes a bunch of interesting issues. So if we can find some way to eliminate the need for that entirely, that would make a lot of people's lives a lot easier. And also it would be great if we can somehow simplify things the creation of uh, of username spaces in some way so to remove some of the difficulty and risks uh, that kind of come with them like right now said so we need to deal with a bunch of security wrappers to do initial initial setup of those namespaces um and it's still gonna need to, still gonna be needed in any in, in many cases but there are some much simpler cases where we might not actually need any of that um and that might make it possible for a lot more software. Like you could think of just, you know, like running, like running a command from a Python script or your web browser or whatever, actively using user namespace as a security construct. Uh, right now it's not super feasible because they would need to rely on the user having a range properly defined at the OS level. And which de depends distro from di distro to distro, and then knowing that nothing else is using those particular UIDs and then using some specific UIDs for some specific things. It's possible right now, but it's such a headache that nobody does it. And it would be great if we could something on things enough that it becomes practical. All right, uh, I'm gonna try and go through the suggestion in you know, ideally a, about five minutes or so, uh, so that we get a bit, uh, we get a remaining 10 minutes to kind of go through some of that uh like because i'm sure some people have opinions and we would like to get that um so some of that was presented to an extent last year i think one of the confusion we had uh, at premiers last year is that we were kind of tangling both bo both the um allocation of user spaces in the way we would like to see them work kind of differently together with the vfs issues and we've luckily been able to entangle that a bit throughout the year. So VFS shifting is now very much a thing. Christian uh, did a great job on, on, on getting that done. And, you know, it's been, that's been merged uh, and that we're adding support for more and more file systems. So that aspect is, can be kind of treated differently and we can base some of the ideas to improve uh, the overall user experience based on, on that stuff. Um, based on those new features. So the rough idea we had, and I'm mean, really not attached to the, I'm more attached to fixing the issues that were shown earlier than the actual suggestion. So if anyone has different thoughts, we can definitely go over that, it's cool. Um, the rough idea we, we had in the past was to maybe try and change UIDT, GIDT to be UN64 within the kernel, not in user space. User space would never see that, obviously but within the kernel. And what that would let us is effectively have a high and low 32 bit. I think the rough idea there being that um, high 32 would be a kernel identifier of sorts and low 32 would be your actual, the, the UID as it's visible to the user. What that then makes it possible is uh, effectively you, you would 
clone or unshare saying, I want a new user namespace and I want it to be some feature of like, like whether we call it isolated or we call it simplified or whatever we call it. If you have that flag set, then you get a namespace in which you do have an entire UID, uh, 32 bit and signed UID and GID range. Every single UID and GID exist in that namespace. They are not mapped to anything. Huh? So you can, you can spawn processes, you can mount, say, a virtual file system, like, you know, TempFS, Fuse, any of those, you could mount them and you could write any UID and GID. It's perfectly fine. It's never hits disk. It never actually goes anywhere outside of that namespace. That would be perfectly, perfectly fine. It would function. Now, where you're going to need to actually do mappings and some of the, the more, um, more complex like privileged kind of setup is going to be when you want a container that's set up in that way to access the actual file system um, from the host. Like if you want to bind map something into it, if you want to do any of that kind of stuff, then for that you will need to actually set up a map for those UIDs inside that completely isolated thing there actually translates to those UIDs going onto the actual, the actual file system. Uh, that's where some of the work done around VFS shifting and the new man, the new man API uh, will help quite a bit with some a lot of the semantics around that, I believe. Um, that's mostly sort of kind of that aspect. There are a few other things I can go over as far as some of the weirdness that will result from doing something like this. Um, the most obvious one that is to me is if you look at the process list, say PS or top or any of that kind of output, right now you see the owner of every single process. That won't work anymore. <laughs> uh, because since a user will be able to clone and get an entire UID and GID range, um, while you can't really represent that, they could run something as you know, UID 1000 in there. And how, uh, how do you differentiate that from the actual UID 1000 in the ancestor namespace? Um, so the fact there being that for all of those situations, uh, it, we kind of have two ways of doing it. One would be overflow UID. That's effectively what's done today for somewhat similar situations right now where like you communicate between siblings that have no overlap then we use overflow right now um, but i think what's something that would, could be possibly a bit cleaner is to actually use uh, the owner of the user namespace that is the uid and gid that initially unshared the namespace um, and use that as effectively the owner for all of it with then added fields to things like proc self status or, or the like that will expose what the inner UID or GID are. So that tooling that does want to show it will be able to pull who owns the actual namespace, what the UID and GID is inside it, and show that as like separate columns or something if you're thinking of, of PS effectively. Um, that's pretty much the rough idea. Um, the, that also applies to a bunch of other things. I think I mentioned on the slide, you know, things like UCREDs. Um, like that includes a UID and GID, so you can have different ways there. Like, do we add an, an additional field that lets us know? So the UID and GID would effectively be the, that owner of the namespace out of the box to avoid breaking any kind of backward compatibility. But then add an extra field so that we can also know what the UID and GID is inside the container for anyone that cares. Uh, we might end up having to do some things like that. It's I think the main thing there is that we don't want to actually affect anything using the existing user namespace semantics and behavior, that nothing should change there. It should be a new way to allocate a slightly different type, slightly different way of doing user namespace. And it's going to be really, really critical that anything that's security sensitive will fail close. Like we don't want to have to patch every single bit of kernel that deals with UID and GID and have what what namespace would actually come from, like what container they come from. That that would be extremely, extremely tedious. So instead, it would be much better to, you know, make sure that everything works the other way around. And you would need to go and in a few places where we do need to be really namespace aware, those effectively unbreak things by allowing them and by properly comparing the, the namespaces. Um, did I miss anything, Christian? <laughs> Uh, 
asking my resident camera engineer because I'm, I'm definitely not one of those. I'm a big consumer of all of that stuff. I might have pretty strong opinions on how I would like things to work, but I'm not a camera engineer. So. Uh, Oh, okay. Christian disappeared. Huh. He just texted me that uh, something broke and it's going to be back. Okay. No, sorry. Oh. I uh, accidentally closed uh, the session because apparently I can't deal with computers. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I was just asking you, like, as the resident can uh, engineer, thank, sure thank you very much for that everything's correct. Thank you very much for the summary and uh, representing an idea we've already presented uh, last year. And uh, I think this summarizes it all. And uh, with that, we should have four minutes for discussion before we need to move on, unfortunately. Yeah, did I miss, uh, did I miss anything? Did I cover everything we, we discussed like yep. when we wrote those slides? Yep. <laughs> I'd say that uh, Amir Tanan is his camera. I don't think we've got audio Hi. yet. So. Hey. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, obviously, this this uh, th thing is not supposed to nest, but um, I'm a little bit confused about the part uh, related to nesting because sometimes you want to nest using Nespace more than once, and currently ID uh, map mounts do not support that. I I don't know what's the plan for the future. So, can you say a few words about? nesting what is supposed to be supported and which use cases and yeah so i would definitely expect nesting to be a thing like i don't see a problem well, well not for that simple yeah thing. well so well so i don't see why you wouldn't be because like effectively the idea is that like every time someone asks to clone one of those kind of user namespaces they will use one of those 32-bit identifiers and they will get a new a new namespace that that stands completely on its own, has no shared UID or GID with its ancestor. So there's no problem with nesting that to any level. Now, where things get tricky is if you do want to share file system access in any way with your ancestor, then for that you do need uh, to rely on the the VFS ID map feature or potentially other other helping features that we need to to sort that out. But the general idea is like, if we take it at its basics, I would like as a completely untreated user to be able to unshare one of those, uh, make a empty tempfs my root file system in there. So no shared file system whatsoever with the host, dump a busy box binary and spawn that as my init system in my container. And I would, should be able to access every single UID and GID and do whatever I want because I don't have any persistent file system. Everything is virtual. Uh, and I should not need any privileged helper whatsoever to do something on that. I will still do for like network and whatnot, but like until you need to share data with anything outside of your namespace, you should be okay. Right, and let, except then uh, you wouldn't have the the high uh, UID bits uh, represent the the root namespace uh, UID, so that breaks. Uh, Right. Just I mean, the, 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 effectively, effectively, that high UID would be a effectively random value the kernel picks every time someone calls and share. It would be completely invisible to user space. It's only used so that in kernel you can compare two namespaces and know this is one thousand in this one. This is one thousand in this one. This is not the same thing. Don't treat them as the same thing as our access control. Stefan's original idea here was that it's essentially like a cookie, right, for a namespace, and but instead of instead of his argument back in the days was that uh, instead of having the cookie directly in the namespace itself uh, where you need to retrieve it every time possibly requiring you to pass the namespace around everywhere you can just directly encode it in the uh, uid and gid right that way that avoids having to modify every single thing that is with a uid or gid within the kernel because that would that's the part that it that would potentially be disastrous if we get anything wrong. Um, I think that that was, I mean, to be fair, the, the 64 bit UID thing is actually something that was suggested by Eric Biderman two or three years ago at Planners when we kind of talked through some of those ideas like, hey, that's something we might be able to do. Um, I'm not attached to the actual way, but that does seem like a 
way to fail safe instead of failing open effectively. Okay, I'm sorry. I it makes uh, sense. Thanks. I need to be. Uh, I don't remember if the next one on us, Mike. Do you know if the next thing is at first? Half past or now? I don't remember. The next one is at thirty. We we had okay, enough so content that ago. we essentially that we that's essentially only four years. Yeah. yeah. Right. So uh, the next talk. I mean, Stefan, you can also do this as well. We can also all just show up. Hello, Tom. Yeah. So we can set up Hi. Tom now. Uh, yeah, as yeah. I said, like I'm unfortunately traveling right now, so I won't be able to stick around much longer. But thank, uh, you can always you. hit up. Like Christian will be around, so you can always talk to him, or you can hit me by email or anything. Um, actually, just before we switch sides, let me just switch back here. Yeah, call me. Uh, if if anyone needs if anyone needs our email addresses or anything and want to chat about this some more, um, that's something we're gonna be definitely looking into more over the next few months. Uh, I think to to see what we can do. It's not the kind of thing where like it's an immediate blocker for any of the stuff we do these days, but we can see it being very, very good for adoption of username spaces if we can make things easier. And it will also, like we see more and more of those network authentication stuff and in its system is deciding to now do um, some amount of uh, UID and GID biased security features and all that stuff. It would be great if we could switch to that, um, but have some solution for that anyway. So hit us up if you've got anything. Um, very happy to, to have more to chat at that point.